Well, friends, once again, welcome to Foundation Church. My name is John. I'm the pastor here. And today we're going to talk a little bit about staying power. Now, before we get into this, I've got this saying that I think you've all heard. I'm going to start it and hopefully you're going to finish it and it's going to work out really well. Are you ready? When the going gets tough, the tough get going. Yeah, that's the way I always heard it too. I was hopeful maybe you guys heard it a different way because that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. In my mind, that makes me think that when things get hard, the people who are really tough just leave. They just like run away. And today we're talking about the opposite of that. When things get tough, those with real fortitude stay and persevere and endure and grow and ultimately overcome. And that's what we're talking about with staying power today. So if you're in the middle of a rough season in your life, if this has been a crappy week or a terrible day, or you've got a bad one coming up, this is the message for you. But let's start out simpler, easier, and gentler with this question. How much candy is too much? How much candy is too much? Now take a minute and share with somebody around you, or if you're online, just comment down below. How much candy is too much? Go for it. <clears throat> okay. Hopefully that was enough time for at least one of you to begin the conversation and everyone else to say, that's not fair, I didn't get my turn yet. Take your turn after church. Here's the reality, it depends, right? Probably a few of you said, well, it, it depends on what kind of candy. Like circus peanuts, my good buddy Nate says, any of it is too much, right? But for me, never enough. I love those so much, right? It also may depend on the person, are you diabetic? Then if there's sugar in it, any candy is too much. This depends, but if I were to be entirely honest, whether I'm diabetic or not, whether it's my favorite candy or my least favorite candy, the answer for me is almost it's never too much. I like candy, nay, I love candy. And I love Halloween when my kids were little because they would go out and collect candy from people. It's this amazing thing. They show up at someone's door and someone gives them free candy. And then my kids come home and all of that free candy is for me. Parents, if you're not doing this, you're not doing it right. It becomes your candy. We would collect it all and we would divvy it out once in a great while when they did good things, which meant most of it was mine. Uh, and one of the things that I love to do every single Halloween is sort the candy. Yeah, in person, people, you're seeing a picture of the candy sorted. And I sort it by like the type of candy. Sometimes I sort it by the colors as well. I love to sort things. I don't know why. I think I missed maybe a calling in my life to be a sorter of some sort. Is that a job? I love it. I love to sort it. And I will sort all my kids' candy and then I will take a picture of it. And then I will just scoop it all into a bucket or into a bag and it goes away. I don't, I don't know. I'm a weird, I'm a weird guy. Now, here's the thing, though. We're not really talking about candy today. What we're really talking about is how much is too much. How much of anything is too much? How much is too much for you? Right? That's really what we're talking about here today. And again, it's going to depend on two things. What are we talking about? Right? If we're talking about candy, maybe it's never too much. If we're talking about torture, just the thought of it is too much. It also is going to depend on the person. Right? Again, you heard me say that for me, circus peanuts, never too much. For some of you, circus peanuts, the thought of them, too much. It also depends on the person. But no matter what we're talking about or who we are, the reality is that all of us want to grow in our ability to have that staying power. All of us want to be able to endure more, to persevere through more so that hopefully when we really need to, we can overcome more. And that's what we're going to actually be talk, talking about today. To help us do that, I'm going to be reading for you a passage of Scripture from 2 Thessalonians. It comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 to 4. And then I'm actually going to jump ahead a little bit and read verses 11 and 12. So if you're following along in your Bibles or on your Bible app on your phone, you'll jump around a tiny bit. If you're in person and looking on the screen, it'll jump around for you. Don't even worry about it. 
Um, a couple things that are important to know, though. 2 Thessalonians is one of the earliest writings we have in the New Testament or in the second part of your Bibles. It was written to a church in a city called Thessalonica. That's not very tricky, right? And it was a church that the Apostle Paul started himself. So it was like his baby, his child. He loved this church like a parent loves a child. And so when he's writing to them, he's giving them this kind of uh, parental type of advice. The other thing that maybe is helpful to understand is that 2 Thessalonians was likely written because the church in Thessalonica was dealing with increased opposition. They were having more and more hardship. They were persevering through and enduring more. And so this letter's come to them at a difficult time in their life. All right, with that said, I'm going to read to you again 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and then jump into 11 and 12. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of all you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word. It's given freely for each and every one of you. I want to take you back to verse 3. In verse 3, we have Paul writing to this church in Thessalonica, this Thessalonian church. And he says, we ought, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. I want to focus in on that growing faith and that increasing love. Let's start with the faith that's growing. That word growing means to increase beyond measure. It's not just like a tiny bit, right? It's not, it's not just a little bit of growth. It's growth so big that we can't measure how much it's happened. And this, again, is connected to their faith. Furthermore, he goes on and talks about the love that they have for one another, and he says that that is increasing. And the word increasing there actually means more than enough. And so they have this love for one another that's more than enough, and they have this faith that can't be measured. This sounds good. Paul is saying some really, really good stuff is happening in this church. And the question that you should be asking yourself, you may not be, but you should be, is how can I get that? How can I have faith that's growing beyond measure? How can I have love that is more than enough? Now, to help us continue this, the Apostle Paul doesn't stop there, but before we get into the next verse, I have a second question for you. You heard me say that the church in Thessal Thessalonica was started by Paul, that they were like a child to him, that he was even proud of them. And so I want to ask you all, who are you proud of? Now, this could be your spouse, this could be your child, this could be your parent. It could be a coworker, or as some of my friends in the tech booth today said, it could be yourself. But take a second, if you're in person, share with somebody around you. If you're online, just share down below. Who are you proud of? This is funny. The first question, how much candy is too much? Everyone wanted to talk. Who are you proud of? Everyone's a little sheepish here. I'm not sure if that's because you're not proud of anybody or if because the person you're most proud of is you and you don't want to sound like that guy or that gal. Um, but the thing is, Paul is proud of this church. As a matter of fact, he's so proud of them that he feels an obligation to tell other people about it. It's like the parent whose child does something so incredible, they just can't contain it. They have to share it with everybody and anybody and all buddy. Is that a word, all buddy? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Look, let's go to verse four, because here's where we start to see why Paul is proud of them. Right? You may think it's because their faith is growing and their love is increased, but that's not why he's proud of them. Verse 4 is telling us why. In verse 4, Paul says, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials 
that you are enduring. See, I want to highlight those two words, perseverance and enduring. They're very, very similar to each other. That word perseverance means to patiently endure. It literally means to remain under. See, Paul is saying, I'm so proud of you guys because you're having a hard time and you are staying there. You're remaining under the hardship. It's the opposite of that saying that we all said earlier today. And when I first read this, all I could think of, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures like this. It's, it's like a big, massive, strong, vicious lion and a tiny little baby lion cub on top of it. Yeah, I think we got a picture for in-person people. You see that? It's like that. that. That big lion could just eat that little baby lion. And that little baby lion will swat at its head and bite on its ears and dangle off of it. It's very similar to what you see when you have a child climbing all over a parent. And the parent could just smash them, but they endure. They remain under that because hopefully they love that child and that lion loves that lion cub. That's what Paul is saying is going on in the church for the Thessalonians. They're experiencing hardship and yet they are choosing to stay not because they love hardship, but rather because they have a purpose in that place and time that they care for more than their own comfort. And you heard me say I was going to talk about that word endure also. That word endure seem, uh, means something similar, to hold up, to bear with. And Paul is saying that you guys are remaining under, you are bearing with, you are not quitting. When the going is getting tough, you are not going, but you are staying. And that's what really makes him proud. But more than that, that's actually what leads to that growing faith and that overabundance of love is the endurance. Now, he doesn't stop there. We want to end by looking at verse 11. Because in verse 11, Paul says, this is great. You guys are enduring, you're holding up, you're remaining under, you're growing in faith and love. But it turns out you don't exist just to exist. Verse 11, in part, Paul says, that our God may make you worthy of his calling. See, it turns out as people of God, we have a calling. And it's not just to be here, to exist in this place and time. It's more. For Paul, of course, that calling is an invitation. It's an invitation from God to share good news with the world. That good news would be specifically the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The freedom that he offers to all people in the face of their own sin and their own impending death. This is good news. But if you don't hear anything else, what I want you to hear here and now is that we today exist for a purpose, not just to exist, but for more. And that's why we want to have that staying power, right? We want to grow in our ability to stick with it, to stay to it, to even perhaps overcome when we experience hardship. It's not just about existing again. It's also about purpose. But how do we get that increased staying power? Well, there's actually this other writing that the Apostle Paul wrote. It was a little bit later, and it was to a church he didn't start, a church he didn't love like a child, but a church that he wanted to help out. It comes in the book of Romans. Uh, I'm going to be reading just a little passage from Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. See, in Romans 5, 3 and 4, Paul is talking to the Christians in Rome. And he says, not only, but also so that we may glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. See, Paul realizes that when we have hard times, it gives us the opportunity to persevere. And if we persevere, it gives us character. And if we have increased character, then we have hope that we can overcome the hard times. For Paul, this is a process. It is a journey and necessarily requires difficulty. How do you get your faith to grow more? You need to put yourself through difficulty. It's similar to how you get your body to grow stronger. You need to first make it endure difficulty. And that for Paul is the, is the key and is the trick that leads to staying power. I want to take this to a personal and to a foundation corporate level here, this conversation. And so I'm going to go with this final question, and that is, have you ever experienced or faced opposition in your life? Now, this can just be a yes or no. So in-person people, just go ahead and raise your hands if you've ever experienced opposition in your lives. Now, the reality is that this is really a yes or yes in all caps question. 
There's not really a no option. All of us experience opposition all the time. From the moment we wake up until the moment we go to sleep, some of it is more in your face, some of it is more directed and you know it, and some of it is subtle. And it's just the world doing what the world does, but all of us have experienced opposition. And this happens in our personal lives, and this happens in our corporate lives. And so I want to share with you a little bit of story time about the early, early, early days of Foundation Church. This is like when Foundation Church was just a tiny little baby. See, we're five years old now, so that makes us like firmly a child. But before we were a child, before we were any years or even months, when we were still just days and weeks old, our church experienced opposition. Now, some people, some of you have been around since like the Mirador days. I think we got a picture of Mirador for in-person people. Yeah, the Mirador days, that was glorious. But what I'm talking about is really even before Mirador, we experienced some hardship. It came in the form of letters, phone calls, and even in-person meetings where other people were saying things like, your church should not exist. Your church does not have a purpose here, and it shouldn't be. Now, this happened in the planning stages and after the church existed, even into the Mirador days, I got to hear people say, you shouldn't exist. You don't have purpose here. You need to close up shop and go home. That's opposition. And I'm not going to lie, that was sad and hard and difficult to experience. Those who knew about that and those who have heard about that kind of stuff, to a person I'll say, that is a bummer. That's sad news. But you know what that really did for us? First of all, it showed us that like nobody was giving us anything on a silver spoon. That is not how life works. You don't just get given things. But furthermore, it forced us to narrow down and say, what is our purpose? Right? We said, we do exist for a purpose. We do have a purpose. And so it forced us to identify that purpose. Now here at our church, we say that our purpose is to build community, to make a difference, to help people reclaim their faith. And we've been really, really clear about that. And we have stories and illustrations and things that connect to that. And we say, that is our purpose or our vision here. But we could boil all of that down, those fancy words and that fancy language, down to a few, simply good news. We exist to bring good news into a hurting and broken world. To people who face opposition each and every day, some of them all day long. And we say, we're here to bring good news to them. And we think that this is honestly the purpose of every church and every Christian. Every person who claims to follow Jesus all around the world has a purpose of bringing good news to people who are hurting and lost. That's why we want to have staying power. That's why we want to be increasing in our ability when the going gets tough, not to get going, but to remain under to endure, to persevere, and perhaps even to overcome the hardship so that we can bless others, so we can bring good news into a world that is deficient of good news. Ultimately, so that we can, uh, so that we can share that good news that we have. So if you remember nothing else from today, I want you to remember that we have good news to share. It's connected to Jesus. It's about life and overcoming hardship, sin, and death. But if you can't remember anything else, tell people, we have good news and you can experience it here. With that said, I'm going to invite you guys to join me in prayer. God, help us to have that staying power. When we experience adversity, hardship, or even persecution, help us to remain under, not to get going somewhere else, but to stay where you've called us so that we might not only grow in our faith and our love in our staying power, but hopefully, Lord, so we can remember that we have a purpose to share good news and to spread that to so many who need it so badly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.